On Who Are You This Morning, my guest is Matthew Pavlich. And I want you to tell me why we're going to hear this Pearl Jam song, which has the longest title of any song we've ever played in this segment. What's the song and what does it mean to you? The song is um, Elderly Woman Behind the Counter in a Small Town. Of course it is. Uh, on Versus, their second sort of major um, album that came out. Pearl Jam is a, a group, a grunge group that I grew up with in my teenage years. I think 91, 92 was when um, Nirvana rolled onto the scene and, you know, with their um, the smash hit and Smells Like Teen Spirit and, and all this grunge music started to take off and that was basically my formative years, really. And, and um, this song's important because it, there's a few poignant lines in it, but it, it's basically about um, people from small towns and, um, like it or not, both Adelaide and Perth are relatively small towns and... I think there's some poignancy there with regard to, to my life, going back to Adelaide, um, but, you know, obviously always trying to remain the same person as when I left. I seem to recognise your face Fade away Hearts and thoughts they fade It's Pearl Jam. Matthew Pavlich is my guest on Who Are You? I don't want to talk a lot of footy with you today, but I do want to ask you, because I think the story is pretty fantastic. At the age of 17, you hope that you're going to be picked up by one of the Adelaide teams. That makes perfect sense. And nothing happens. And then in 1999, you're picked up by the Dockers. And you're always asked, I guess, what is your memory of that life-changing day? I was pretty convinced leading into the draft that uh, I'd end up uh, at Frio, uh, at the time, we had three of the f- top five draft picks, um, and Richmond weren't interested that who had picked three, um, and Collingwood had basically committed to Josh Fraser at that time at pick one. So uh, I basically, leading into the draft, thought I was going to be a docker. And I only want to talk about the arrival. Well, my very <laughs> first training session is memorable for all the wrong reasons. Um, I collapsed on my very first training session. Um, I'd arrived the previous night from Adelaide after um, a week or so long down at sort of schoolies or leavers week uh, with with my mates and having a good time and and sort of rejoicing in finishing exams and all that type of stuff. And um, Paul Hazeby actually picked me up um, my first morning and he drove me to Aquinas College where um, you know, we were preparing for training. And what happens these days with all the rookies and, and draftees that get drafted, they hardly um, drop a bead of sweat on their in their first week at the club because they're screened and, you know, the doctors see them, the physios check them out, the strength and conditioning officers go through everything. And, um, yeah, they, they don't do much. And But back in my time, 14 years ago, um, we, did, we were expected to do the entire first session. So I think we did about an hour, hour and a half of ball work and then um, – we finished the session with six 1K time trials and I went as hard as I could in the ball work part of it, obviously trying to impress and, and make an impression and all those types of things as a young 17-year-old would do. And then on the very final 1K time trial, the sixth one, I um, just started to feel really average and really poor and started to drop off the back of my group and um, of my running group. And, and yeah, I, I passed out. I, I collapsed and I couldn't. I don't remember anything um, basically from that you know, taking off that last lap. And um, apparently what happened, Jeff Boyle, our physio, and Ken Withers, our club doctor, is still with us now. And uh, I think Stephen Platt and, our, and Pat, Pat Watson, the property guy, threw us in the back of the property van, r- raced down the freeway to Murdoch Hospital, threw us in intensive care, and, and there I stayed for two nights. So I was actually meeting some of the players for the first time, you know, outside of saying day on the track. Um coming into hospital saying, geez, what happened? How, how are you going? So, um, how soon after that did you bang into the back of Troy Cook's car? A week. A week? Yeah, a week later. We, we, were, we had a recovery session um, down at Port Beach and we are driving back to the football club and it was sort of mid-morning traffic and a couple of the players were doing the wrong thing, sort of darting in and out of traffic. And I was just trying to be the sensible one at the back and just thought I'd you know, sort of wait for everyone. And I'd obviously looked down and changed the, the station at some stage on the radio and looked back up and Cookie's car was a millimetre in front of me and I went up went up his, his rear end and, and my bonnet actually basically started flicking up. 
and I had to catch it outside of, believe that I had to catch this bottom, stuck my hand out the window, thank God the window was down and threw it back down. And anyway, we got back, get arrested for that sort of stuff. I shouldn't be divulging it. But anyway, it was a really bad way to start an AFL career. If you're out there listening and you're a young guy or um, trying to get onto an AFL list, don't, don't do, do it. Don't, don't do, do any it of those way. things. I'm not even going to talk too much about the intervening years because we know a lot about them. But I want to provide another quote from your dad, which is this, where he says, we are through and through dockers with purple and white blood and we just want the side to do well. But there is always tremendous pressure on him to do everything right all the time. Do you feel that? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, as captain and leader um, of the team, both performance-wise but every waking moment, it's about... um, about doing the right thing. Um, clearly, there's been a lot of examples in the past where sports people, uh, unfortunately, make the wrong choices and they make the sometimes you know what we would term an easy choice and decide to go down the path of indulgence. And um, clearly, that doesn't help the individual, but clearly, it doesn't help the team or the club um, or the broader AFL. So um, it's an enormous amount of pressure and responsibility that you know I've taken on. And I think if you sort of go through when I first took over the captaincy from, from Peter, um, we had an enormous amount of experience, you know, sort of both the Carboys, McManus, Peter himself, Shane Parker, Cook, Walker. Mm. Um, we had a massive transition period and, and then drafted on all the players you see today, Hill, DeBoer, Fife, Morabito. So sort of dealing with that transition, a couple of poor seasons of rebuilding and then seeing possibility in some of these younger players. Um, all the time trying to do the right thing by them and try to do the right thing by performing for the fans. It's um, it's, a, it's a delicate balance. Have there been times you haven't liked it very much? Um, yeah, when we lose. I'm extremely competitive and have always, in any anything that I've been involved in, wanted to be successful at it and, and drive it as hard as I can to, to achieve. And um, football being the thing that pays my bills and is my absolute passion in life, I... Yeah, don't like losing. But you've lost a lot. Yeah, I've won a lot as well. You have, but of the great modern players, you've spent much of your career with a club that others deem to have underperformed. We argue now that the situation's different. But what do you learn from losing? You learn how to review. You learn how to analyse, self-analyse and team analyse. You learn the character of not only yourself but of other individuals in your team and how they react to... um, you know, poor performances or conversely good performances. Sometimes you learn as much on the other hand when you, you play well, how guys react and, uh, and how you react. But ultimately, you learn that the values and behaviours that you agree to as a group and that you try to model yourself stand up. Um, and regardless of, you know, what happens, four points go your way or not, they're your guiding light. 